News contributor and has been a guest on MSNBC, C-SPAN, and national radio programs. She's the author of seven books published by Regenerate Publishing. She's founded the conservative websites Twitchy and Hot Air. Please give a warm welcome to Michelle Malkin.
No, consider me sweet and sour sauce, or soy sauce, <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> I've heard the phrase often echoed, and I've heard it today, and in general, I agree with the notion we have to cling to this idea that there are more of us than there are of them. And certainly from the outpouring of support and the visual, optical, physical presence of you, yes, there are more of us than there are of them but we can't take it for granted that it will always be this way. Yeah. And I want to hit on a number of different pillars of the concept of sovereignty. I spoke earlier this afternoon of three of those. Sovereignty of the individual, sovereignty of the family, and sovereignty of our nation. And Earlier when I spoke, I took it in that order, but I'm going to reverse it. And one of the main policy issues that is of existential import to our country is the policy area that I dedicated my very first book to, that I covered extensively in my very first newspaper job in Los Angeles in the early 1990s and have continued to pound the drum on uh, through the 9-11 episode uh, in this country through three books, Invasion, my first book, sold out, uh, one of the books I wrote in the middle of, of the seven books uh, regarding the impact of many of these tech worker programs on American workers, and my most recent book, which I was on a book tour for in 2019 called Open Borders Inc. And what you need to understand, what every Republican, what every law-abiding patriot in this country has to understand is demographics is destiny. Demographics is destiny. You wonder how California turned out the way it did? 1965, the Hart Seller Act, and 1986, IRCA, the so-called Immigration Reform and Control Act, which was unfortunately signed by, God bless him, Ronald Reagan. The bargain, the deal that was supposed to happen with IRCA and the mass amnesty of several million illegal aliens in this country was, we'll give them a one-time amnesty and in return, we'll get secure borders. <laughs> How's that working out for you? You don't need to be a rancher in Arizona or Texas. You don't need to be a border resident in the Southwest to understand palpably that that bargain failed. We got the raw end of the deal. And ever since 1986, there have been almost two dozen congressionally passed legislative amnesties and many others through executive orders that have repeated the mistake over and over again. Amnesty begets amnesty begets more illegal immigration. Now, Maybe the problem would have would have not been so intractable if that was just the issue, illegal immigration. And most of your standard establishment Republicans will at least acknowledge, yeah, that's a bad idea. Allowing people to butt in front of the line and flout our immigration laws, uh, come here illegally, wait, play the waiting game for amnesty, bad idea. And they understand You'll hear it, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very sort of normy thing to acknowledge that the ultimate goal of amnesty Democrats is, guess what? A permanent ruling majority. Duh. <laughs> Duh. And that this is why Open Borders Inc. and philanthropists like we all know, George Soros, yes, it's okay to boo. Yeah. Thank you. Have as their goal amnestying millions upon millions and then times millions more because of continued chain migration, this permanent ruling majority that will always side with socialism, that will always side with big government, that will broaden and turn every once former red state like California. I lived in California when it was a red state, believe it or not. Man, man I'm old. And 
that was the goal. But it's not just illegal immigration. Now, I speak to you, obviously, uh, as someone whose life story is an open book, as the child of legal immigrants to this country. My father was an neonatologist. He was recruited. Uh, he was a medical resident at uh, Johns Hopkins University. And he spent his entire professional and personal life giving back to this country. As so many other legal immigrants who chose to become naturalized Americans have done. Now, I am often accused of being a traitor, of pulling up the ladder, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and along with my advocacy for legal immigration, which has become more refined and defined as a general matter of being opposed to mass migration, both legal and illegal, I am often accused of being a, believe it or not, a white supremacist. <laughs> I am the blindest white supremacist you will ever meet. So shake my hands if you want to I'm not making this up. Just last week, a journalist, journalist, <laughs> named Talia Lavin, an MSNBC contributor, actually had a sentence in her piece wailing and moaning about students on college campuses who, who, who stand up for America first, described me as essentially a patroness of these America first students and called me a white nationalist supremacist. This is what we have to deal with. Now, the problem with so much of the establishment, whether it is the left or right, is that when somebody uses that kind of nuclear bomb, you know what they do? <laughs> they use it. They wince. They cringe. And they apologize. And I am here to tell each and every one of you in this room, stop apologizing. <laughs> Never apologize. with an E, not an A, has preyed upon this weakness that infects too many people who dare dip their toes in the public square in politics. And unfortunately, you see that it, you know, we talk about uh, toxic viruses, <laughs> COVID. How about the Beltway virus? <laughs> How about the virus that infects far too many, unfortunately, Republicans who get sent to fight the Beltway Swamp and then become it, yeah. Yeah. Right? right? And it's wonderful that we have your representatives from Idaho in D.C. who are in but not of the Beltway Swamp. Yeah. Now, yes, thank you. So there's this reflexive cringe when we talk about demographics and we talk about mass migration, because people always want to make this distinction. Well, I'm, I'm against illegal immigration, but I'm for all legal immigration. And they haven't really thought through exactly what they mean by that. Okay, well, you're for legal immigration. How many? Mm -hmm. And where from? Mm -hmm. And is there ever a time we should ever rethink the mass aggregate number of people that we're letting in. And so whether it's guest worker programs or short-term visas, why don't we think more carefully about that? If we care about preserving our homeland and our home, who decides who gets in, how many, and for what reasons? And particularly at a time such as this, a time such as this, over the past year when we have 17 million Americans who've been displaced from work for bogus reasons, the COVID tyranny, particularly at a time over the last year when so many people have suffered as a result 
of what the late conservative columnist Sam Francis called a narco tyranny? Should we not rethink how many get in and who and whether it's a good idea overall? How about, and more and more, great dissident America First Republicans are coming around to the idea, an immigration moratorium. A pause, a freeze, a pause. Hard facts and numbers. It is sobering. But I want you to think about that this phrase that people use, there are more of us than there are of them. That's not always going to be true if we leave our immigration policies on autopilot. So the, the current total US population is about 326 million. The number of foreign born individuals in the US is around 44.5 million currently. The annual number of new green cards that are issued every single year is one million on autopilot. Who drives that policy? Who decides? Is it you? Do you get a vote on that? Do you get input? No, but you know who does? The US Chamber of Commerce. George Soros and his network, his entire constellation of nonprofits dedicated to importing the entire third world into this country. Silicon Valley gets a vote, gets a place at the table. Do you? The estimated number of immigrants admitted over the last 35 years due to chain migration is 20 million. And of course, we all hear the number repeated over and over again, I have for the last 30 years, incredible that it never changes, of 11 million illegal aliens currently. It's been like this since Pew Research Center made up the number 30 years ago. The number is far closer to 22 million, which is what uh, some objective, neutral, believe it or not, Princeton University uh, researchers estimated, or the upward bound, probably closer to 30 million. And those are the ones that Joe Biden, the Democrats, and yes, US Chamber of Commerce, Open Borders, Inc., Silicon Valley, uh, subsidized Republicans want to amnesty as well. You know what I call that? Suicide. Destruction from within. And you know what else I call that? America last, yeah. not America first. The percentage of the population of Guatemala now living in the United States is 6.6%. The percentage of the population of Honduras now living in the US is 9.2%. And the percentage of population of El Salvador now living here is 22%. The US Census projection of population change by 2060, 2060, 60, is 78.2 million people. These have electoral consequences. I've lived in my adopted home state of Colorado now for 13 years. It was referenced at the beginning of this event, how Colorado turned blue. It was a deliberate plan. It was a blueprint. I did a documentary a couple of years ago called Rocky Mountain Heist. And the guy who did the voiceover did it just like that. Rocky Mountain Heist. <laughs> you do not want to have an Idaho heist. And the first thing that you have to understand was that Immigration, mass migration, was one of the pillars of that blueprint. You want to keep Idaho red? You have to re-examine, and unfortunately, your governor cited against President Trump on this, things like the refugee resettlement racket. It is a racket. My investigative mantra for Open Borders Inc. and all of the work that I do in every policy area is follow the money to find the truth. And the, although the Refugee Resettlement Program has a veneer of compassion and is advocated for, promoted by, and perpetuated by a constellation of nonprofits of faith, some of them 
are true believers in what they're doing. A lot of them, unfortunately, based on my investigation and experience over uh, the last 30 years, is that they're in it for this. It is a multi-billion dollar racket. There is a small cadre of nonprofits, many of them which sued the Trump administration when the Trump administration said, we need to restore local control over these decisions about how many refugees come into your neighborhoods and cities and towns and states and where they come from. This went all the way through the courts and the Trump administration lost. The priority of reunifying refugees with remote families members from out of this country was put above Americans and the core basic principle of sovereignty. Who decides who comes into your home? You or the United Nations? You or George Soros? And where are your governors? 18 Republican governors sided with Open Borders, Inc. and against the Trump administration on this. Shame on everyone. Many of them are presidential aspirants. It wasn't just Brad Little. Christy Nome in South Dakota sided with the refugee resettlement racket and against America first. How do you keep Idaho red? How do you keep America red? You have to be able to distinguish between America first advocates who are the real deal and the simulators, the phonies, the people who have hijacked those words and who speak them and pay lip service to them while they're stabbing American workers, families, and taxpayers in the back know the difference. Demographics is destiny. And if we don't control those numbers and freeze them right now, it's, as the kids who are video gamers say, game over. <laughs> game over. Sovereignty of our nation, control over our borders, control over who gets in. If you don't protect your neighborhoods, every aspect of your civic life, your everyday life is affected. Mm -hmm. And that is why I've spent so much of my time, dedicated so much of my journalism to this issue. Earlier in the day, somebody asked me, well, do you think that you're able to say these things in a way that others can't because of the color of your skin. What? And you know, the, and, and it's it's a really interesting question because there are a lot of people who say, well, you know, you're a woman, you're a minority. And I say, well, I'm an American, and my identity is infused, it, it is inextricably linked to my love for this country and the historic American nation. And when I yes. and so, and so my, my advice to the questioner is stop thinking that because you're white that that you're not right. First of all. And oftentimes I have been accused ever since I went to a liberal arts college of acting white. What? What, what does this mean? Thank you. Following the law? <laughs> Desiring financial prosperity? Assimilating? Oh! <laughs> and so, my advice to um, other minorities or, or, or students of color, particularly when I talk on college campuses, uh, who are like minded like me, is when somebody accuses you of acting white, you know what the response is? Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Because what do they mean when, really by inference, when they 
when, when you don't act white, mm. you know, you start to, you start to notice the, the, the things that you're allowed to say and not say. And, you know, if you need some sort of permission for me to, to, to say the unspeakable thing, you have it! Speak louder! Like, well, you know, I don't, I feel like I, I don't need to like, carry the whole burden of all of this, and if you're gonna keep Idaho red, and if you're gonna keep America red, you, it's up to you! You know, you, you don't need you know, permission from non-white people to speak up for you! Unfortunately, there are college students who've been punished for saying this. It's okay to be white. Yes, it is. <laughs> and it's certainly okay to be right. And and so now we come to uh, the uh, another area that I want to talk about briefly. And I know I only have hey, you'll you'll give me the, the this right okay <laughs> is the the role that Ohio Idaho is playing in fighting critical race theory. Bravo to each and every one of you who's fighting to defund it, deplatform it, and rid this toxicity, not just in higher education, but in K through 12. That is where the real threat is. So I asked earlier this afternoon, and I'll ask um, you too, how many of you saw this New York Times opinion piece that appeared just the other day. You guys are national news. Congratulations, Idaho, you triggered the New York Times. <laughs> the social justice purge at Idaho colleges, the subhead of this piece by an opinion columnist named Michelle Goldberg, is Republican lawmakers try to cancel diversity programs. <gasps> and of course, in Orwellian fashion, and I've dealt with this ever since I went to a liberal arts college, is what do they mean when they say diversity? <laughs> they mean the worst kind of ideological conformity in uh, our education system. And I reported on an alarming uh, curriculum that a, a parent sent me. This is um, critical race theory in Missouri, of all places. Springfield, Missouri, where K through 12 kids have to undergo mandatory training, as, as well as their uh, teachers in quote unquote equity training. This means accepting an oppression matrix. Here it is. Rather than doing their multiplication tables, they're doing an oppression matrix. And it classifies all white people as a quote, privileged social group, no matter their socioeconomic status, their life struggles, or their family history. Asians are considered quote unquote oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> despite vast differences in income among Asian groups and despite the higher median net worth uh, and household income than whites. All, quote, this is a quote, all males assigned at birth are inherently more privileged than all, quote, females assigned at birth. And this is also in the oppression matrix. This was interesting. All Protestants are forever more privileged than worshipers of any other faith. What? All Springfield Public School employees must now share reflections upon watching a George Floyd video. And as a condition of employment, outline, quote, what steps you will take to become an anti-racist and engage in a, quote, group discussion on, quote, white supremacy. Well, they should invite me to come and address them. I'm white supremacy. <laughs> Critical race theory. War on whites, basically. And I've got plenty of experience with this uh, since my days 
being indoctrinated at a liberal arts college in Ohio, whose very first act was to segregate me into an ethnic dorm called Asia House. What? I grew up in a, a small rural town of less than 10,000 uh, in South Jersey. I had nothing in common with radical leftist, third, fourth, fifth generation Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans, Korean Americans from LA or San Francisco. And from the very first time I stepped foot on soil at this liberal arts college, it was automatically presumed that I was a victim and that all whites on campus, all whites in America were oppressors. But I learned very early on from my mountain lion mom that I was not a victim. And to say so out loud and to speak obvious truths marginalized me on this supposed college campus that was supposed to be a haven of free thinking and tolerance. <laughs> Man. So I, I recounted for my earlier audience one of the prides and joys of my experience at Oberlin. Being named the second whitest man on campus. Yes! <laughs> and universities and taxpayer subsidized public ones have made young people who think for themselves and who truly believe in America first principles as opposed to America last ones have turned those students into public enemy number one. They face persecution. They face adversity. Their lives have been ruined for things like joking about George Floyd. I'm not kidding you. That happened at Kansas State University to a young man named Jaden McNeil. We've got Duke University, which is now investigating because some anonymous soul out there, who will probably not be anonymous for long because doxing is part of the playbook of the left, dared to post George Floyd's toxicology report onto a BLM banner. And for this, publishing facts from a coroner's report will probably be kicked off campus. His character will be assassinated. Every time you Google whoever this person is, it'll have 100 entries for pages and pages and pages and he'll be called the same name I've been called all the time. White supremacist for posting facts. Again, if it was just American higher education, we might be able to make some headway. Can I get a raise of hands of anyone who is a school board member, has been a school board member, or is considering running? You guys are heroes. Anyone who is a, a, an elected official for um, higher ed, I know there's one at our table, yes. Yeah. Heroes. Can I get any uh, uh, show of hands of everyone in this room who has homeschooled? running my mouth and spending 90 seconds on, on uh, cable TV a couple of times a week, yammering about the things that are wrong in this country. But when I 
sit in a room and I meet so many of you who have made the truly courageous decision to put yourselves out there and run for office, particularly local office. I have nothing but gratitude and respect. That is how you keep Idaho red. That is how you keep blues for the state and turning red. That's how you make America great. I thank each and every one of you who has run for office or is considering running for city council, county board of supervisors, sheriff, state legislature, and then of course the federal offices. And I always invert the pyramid because automatically, you know, people always ask me, oh, are you gonna run for Congress or Senate or you should run for president? No, if I had to pick any office to run for, I'd start with school board. And K through 12 gets the short end of the stick when it comes to sort of punditry and, and, and conic and, and, and all this. But any of us with children or grandchildren know that's where the control begins. And big tech in Silicon Valley know it too. Show of hands for all of you who were in the early days fighting at the forefront against Common Core. Heroes, all of you. And you know, those of us who are veterans of these wars know, it didn't start with Common Core. It was school to work, remember that? Going all the way back to the, the days of one of my heroines, Phyllis Schlafly, yeah. the yeah. first to call out outcome-based education, yeah. and Goals 2000 and Agenda 21. It's all the same thing. They just have different marketing, and they're brilliant, right? With, with all of these acronyms and euphemism, who, who could be against Goals 2000? Who could be against Common Core? It's a core and it's common. <laughs> Man, they're good at it, aren't they? Right? Everything that I read now is something I fought 25, 30 years ago, and I know so many of you feel the, the yeah. same way. Bill Gates, just the other week, math is racist. And I always say racist with like 20 A's because that's what they always did. And I was like, racist. Math is racist because math is objective. Math involves objective truths, and we can't have that. Not in a culture that has been steeped and marinated in cultural rel relativism and moral relativism. There can't be one right answer. No, we need ethnocentric, ethnosensitive math. And this is how you get Mayan math and fuzzy math and new new math. How many of you are familiar with lattice multiplication? Does anyone remember this? Yes, you know what I'm talking about, right? Because the white man way of doing math isn't the only way of doing math. Let's split up the two numbers that we multiply because that's how the Egyptians did it or something, non-white people, and take a half an hour longer to get to the right answer, if you're lucky. If you're lucky. <laughs> it's funny, but obviously, like I must know something about this, right? Because, you know, have you ever tuned into like a Fox News pundit or CNN pundit who will go on and on about this? No. I actually have personal experience with it. And, and when you're trying to discern between people who are just mouthing talking points versus people who really know what they're talking about and have fought these things on the ground, this is one way to measure authenticity, okay? My youngest, who is now 20 years old, was directed in some everyday math curriculum that actually had these questions. If math was a color, what color would it be? <laughs> my answer is red, because that's what I'm seeing. <laughs> Teach my daughter how to add and multiply. And then she came home with a, another piece of homework from a Xeroxed textbook that was marketed by the University of Chicago. Not the math department, not the economics department, but the education department. Uh-oh. 
And she was told uh, to uh, add, you know, do some calculations and estimate the answer. Well, she wrote the actual right answer, and she was marked wrong because she was supposed to have the estimate and not the right answer. When we have these zealots undermining objectivity and logic, corrupting math, that's it. Game over. And if a school cannot properly teach math, they can't teach anything. Right. And this, and so you wonder how we end up with the last year with people, sheeple, Go ahead now. swallowing every last lie, falsehood, and piece of misinformation that came out of Anthony Fauci's mouth. And you wonder how it is so quickly that people folded and capitulated and surrendered their basic rights to go to church to send their kids to school, to operate their businesses in this age of anarcho-tyranny and COVID chaos. Mm. Two plus two does not equal four. Masks are bad, masks are good, social distancing based on junk science. And now the prospect of your kids and mine not being able to access education unless they submit to eye scans and submission of their vaccine passports. Yeah. This is the last area that I, I wanna uh, touch on, medical freedom. Right. And medical tyranny. And again, I think this topic because of course it is of particular concern and an area in which your grassroots parents have led. I cannot tell you how encouraged I was when I saw your parents with their children burning their masks a couple of weeks ago. Triggering all the right people. And the next time you have one of those, could somebody please invite me because I will fly back up here and be with you. these two brave teenagers facing 13 criminal misdemeanor charges for speaking obvious truths, for taking the fascistic adults, run, how appropriate, Moscow, <laughs> to task, criminalizing free thinking young individuals who are exercising sovereignty over themselves yeah. and showing a community what it means to be an active, engaged, patriotic citizen. We need more of that. And I have dedicated much of my career, my life, my personal time, my discretionary time over the last couple of years, doing everything I can to support exactly these types of young people. As parents, the most important decisions that we can make are over our children's bodies and minds. Our children, our choice. standing side by side with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Last summer in Colorado, we were together joining forces to fight a legislative effort to eliminate religious and philosophical objections to mandatory vaccines. And the Children's Health Defense Fund and with all of the work that RFK Jr. does and so many like him, he's an 
vital to protecting the sovereignty of our families and the sovereignty of our nation. And the thing that we have in common is following the money to find the truth. Because whether it's big tech, which is operating in alliance with big pharma, or whether it's big media stifling the voices of dissenters on such issues. We need to find our allies where we can find them. Somebody mentioned that 80-20 rule. 80% uh, of the time agree with the top of the imagine this. And on these types of vital issues, that's absolutely true. When people understand that it's the flow of money dictating where too many of these legislators stand rather than principle, we need to band together where we can. And I can't tell you how devastating it is to be the parent of a child who fears the ostracism that comes with knowing that there's something wrong, with knowing that this entire COVID racket is not about our health, but about control. Yes. Yes. It's all about control. And I know that we have a lot of, of young people in the audience, whether you're college age or in high school or, or uh, elementary level, you need to understand this. You are not alone. You are not the crazy ones. And there's a question that, that, um, that came up at the rally that I was at in, in, um, in Denver last year uh, with RFK Jr. Who calls the shots? And there was a chant that went up. Who calls the shots? Mamas call the shots. Am I right, mamas? Mamas call the shots. And papas know this. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> all the shots. Right? My honey is right here. He knows it. I'm motivated so much every single day to do what I do because I remember the sacrifices that my parents made and I think about the sacrifices that I have made to try and ensure that my own children enjoy the same prosperity, the same sense of safety and freedom that I've enjoyed. That's why we do what we do. We're united by that. And only in strength, in numbers, our numbers, protecting our neighborhoods, this slice of heaven that we have in this beautiful county, in this beautiful town. And making sure that if you do welcome newcomers, that they share your same values. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. right? Unfortunately, you can't wall off all the bad Californians. <laughs> and I do promise this, I've said this to so many people in this room, when I go back to Colorado, I'm gonna talk about what a terrible experience I had here. It's terrible. The traffic's hey, terrible. <laughs>
enshrined to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make us intolerant. It doesn't make us quote unquote nativist or xenophobic. It makes us patriots. Yeah. Yeah. Patriots. through them that defines who we are, who we are. So many of our enemies, the globalist left, the globalist right, will pretend that they know who we are and who we should be. One nation under God, no hyphens, no apology, and the only time that we should be on our knees is when we're praying to God. Otherwise, stand up, speak out, and defend our homeland. Yeah. God bless you.